Section 2.2 covers general solutions of linear equations. This video will cover a variety of topics such as the difference between linear and nonlinear differential equations and the difference between homogeneous and non-homogeneous differential equations. We'll also study topics such as linear independence, the principle of superposition, Ronskin's, and the general solution of a linear equation as the sum of a complementary function and a particular function. Sounds like a lot of details, but this is really a straightforward and simple section. Let's begin by examining second order linear differential equations. Once we examine second order linear differential equations, we'll generalize this information to fit higher order linear differential equations. So keep in mind, the first part comes from section 2.1 in your textbook. We begin with a definition. The second order differential equation, big G of x, that's the independent variable, y, the dependent variable and its derivatives, y prime and y double prime, the highest derivative we can find here is the second derivative, so we are dealing with a second order differential equation. This is equal to zero, is linear provided that g is linear in the dependent variable y and its derivatives. It can be written in the form a of x times y double prime plus b of x times y prime plus c of x times y equals f of x where the coefficient functions are continuous. Keep in mind the coefficient functions may be nonlinear. For example, a of x may be something like x squared or the square root of x or 1 over x. So this differential equation is linear in the dependent variable y and its derivatives, not necessarily in the coefficient functions of the independent variable. It's linear in y because we will not find a product between y and one of its derivatives, and we won't see y raised to an exponent or a power other than 1. Let's see if we can spot the difference between linear and nonlinear differential equations in example 1. Determine if the following differential equations are linear or nonlinear. Example A, we have e to the x times y double prime plus cosine of x times y prime plus the square root of x times y equals 4. So first of all, notice that our independent variable here is x and our dependent variable is y. We know that because the primes are applied to the dependent variable y. Also notice this is a second order differential equation because the highest derivative that I can find there is 2. So the coefficient functions are e to the x, cosine of x, and square root of x. The constant on the other side, 4, that's the f of x from the definition. Notice that these coefficient functions are all nonlinear functions, but this is a linear differential equation. Linear because y, y prime, and y double prime are not raised to a power, and there is no product between y and one of its derivatives. So this is an example of a linear differential equation. Think about how this connects to what you know about algebraic equations. In one variable, an algebraic linear equation looks something like ax plus b equals c. This is a linear equation in one variable. Whereas if we write ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero, this is an example of a nonlinear differential, nonlinear algebraic equation or even something like square root of x plus 7 equals 8. This is also nonlinear. The variable is experiencing an operation, an exponent or a square root, something like that. So applying this to differential equations, we're examining the dependent variable y, making sure that it's not raised to a power or having some other operation applied to it, like a product with another dependent variable or derivative. Okay, I think you get the idea. Let's look at example B. We have y double prime plus y times y prime equals x to the 3 halves. In this case, the independent variable, again, is x, and the dependent variable is y. We know that y is the dependent variable because the primes are applied to the dependent variable. 
Also, this is specifically a second order differential equation. Now, what do you think, linear or nonlinear? Hopefully you said nonlinear. This is nonlinear because of this term right here. We have the product between the dependent variable y and one of its derivatives. So what this means is we will not be able to apply the methods of solution that we study in chapter two to nonlinear differential equations. Our focus in chapter two is linear differential equations. Now, one more important definition we need to talk about before we move on. If big F of X equals zero, so up here in our representative linear second order differential equation, if the function of the independent variable over here on the right side is equal to zero, then the differential equation is homogeneous. The equation AX times Y double prime plus BX times Y prime plus C of X times Y equals zero is the homogeneous linear differential equation associated with the non-homogeneous linear differential equation that we studied up here. One. Our goal in chapter two is to learn how to solve non-homogeneous linear differential equations. To do that, we're first gonna solve the corresponding homogeneous linear differential equation and then use that to generate the solution to the non-homogeneous differential equation. Now, let's take this pattern and generalize it to fit higher order linear differential equations. And here's where section 2.2 starts from your textbook. Definition, an nth order linear differential equation can be written in the form p naught of x times the nth derivative of y plus p sub one of x times the n minus first derivative of y plus dot dot dot, that means this pattern continues, plus p sub n minus one of x times y prime plus p sub n of x times y equals f of x, where f of x and p sub i of x are continuous for all i. So notice this upside down A here. This is a symbol representing our univer universal quantifier. When you see the upside down A, you can read it for all. This simply means that all of our coefficient functions of the independent variable X are continuous functions of X. Our non-homogeneous term F of X is also a continuous function. This differential equation is linear in y and its derivatives. Observe the notation of the higher order derivatives. Whenever the exponent is in parentheses, that indicates the order of the derivative, not a power. We wanna make sure and distinguish between the two. So we'll know when we're dealing with a linear differential equation and a nonlinear differential equation. Now, as we saw above, if this term over here, big F of X is equal to zero, then we say the equation is homogeneous. So this is related to the first definition that we talked about. The only difference is that we're looking at an nth order linear differential equation as opposed to a second order linear differential equation. Our goal is to learn how to solve a higher order linear differential equation, but first we have to know, does a solution even exist? So in part A, we're gonna talk about existence and uniqueness of solutions. This is theorem two from your textbook. If P sub one, P sub two, up to P sub n, notice we're dealing with lowercase p's this time as opposed to uppercase p's. They're gonna be related, but they're different. And little f as opposed to big F, if these are continuous functions on an open interval I containing A, then the IVP, that is initial value problem, nth derivative of Y plus P sub one of X times the N minus first derivative of Y plus this ellipsis, the dot, 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 means this pattern continues up through P sub N minus one of X times Y prime plus P sub N of X times Y equals f of x. So let's pause for just a minute. The hypothesis of this theorem, the hypothesis follows the word if. If the coefficient functions and my non-homogeneous term f of x are continuous, then our differential equation is going to have a unique solution. That is the necessary and sufficient condition 
to have an existent and unique solution. Notice we are in the context of an IVP or initial value problem. So to solve an nth order differential equation to find a particular solution, we need a set of initial conditions and that's what we see here. Y of A equals B sub 1, Y prime of A equals B sub 2, and the n minus first derivative of a equals b sub n minus 1. These are n conditions. Notice each of those functions are evaluated at a. And that's what this is all about, an open interval i containing a. So if the coefficient functions p sub 1 up through f are continuous and they contain this value a, on some open interval subset of their domain, then our nth order linear differential equation has a unique solution on that interval containing a. Now that interval may be something like negative infinity to infinity, or it may be a subset of that domain. And by the way, just like we learned a new symbol up here, the upside down a meaning for all, if you see an exclamation point in the middle of a sentence, not after a number like factorial, but in the middle of a sentence, you read that as the word unique in math. There is a symbol for everything in math. Now, there was a subtle change between our original definition for an nth order linear differential equation and this differential equation where we're making an inference about the uniqueness of solutions. So the question says, how is double star different from triple star? So notice in our definition, we have p naught of x times the nth derivative of y. We're also dealing with uppercase letters for our functions, including our non-homogeneous term. Whereas in this theorem, we're starting with the nth derivative of y. So the coefficient function here is one. Then our next coefficient function is little p sub one of x, and over here, our non-homogeneous term is little f of x. So the change that occurred from here to here is simply that we're dividing every term through by big P naught of x. So divide each term of the equation in double star by big P naught of x to obtain the equation in triple star. Okay, this simply gives us a leading coefficient function of one, making it just a little bit easier to deal with. So we are looking at a lot of details here. What's the bottom line? What do you need to know at this point? Number one, you need to be able to distinguish between a linear differential equation and a nonlinear differential equation, a homogeneous differential equation and a non-homogeneous differential equation. Remember that just has to do with having a zero on the right side or a function of the independent variable. And finally, you need to know that a unique solution exists if our linear differential equation has continuous coefficient functions. That's pretty simple and straightforward. Once we know that a solution exists for a linear differential equation, we want to know what's the nature of that solution. So in part B, we're going to talk about the principle of superposition. But before we go there, I want to remind you of an associated concept from algebra that might help you. Let's look at a simple one variable linear algebraic equation and a simple one variable quadratic equation. How many solutions exist for that linear equation? One solution, right? How do you know? Because it is a degree one algebraic equation. How many solutions exist for the quadratic equation? Hopefully you said two solutions. How do we know? Because it's a degree two algebraic equation. So the degree of the polynomial indicates the number of solutions. They may not be distinct. We may have repeated solution there, but when multiplicity is considered, the Expo, the highest exponent or the order of the polynomial indicates the maximum number of solutions. A similar thing is going to happen with differential equations, but instead of looking at a power, we're going to be looking at the order of a derivative.
So let's talk about the principle of superposition. Let y sub 1, y sub 2, up to y sub n be n solutions of an nth order homogeneous linear differential equation. Do you see the connection there? Just like we have a degree 2 algebraic equation with two solutions or a degree 1 algebraic equation with one solution, we can anticipate that an nth order differential equation will have n distinct solutions. For constants c sub 1, c sub 2, up to c sub n, the linear combination, here's a new vocabulary word, the linear combination y equals c sub 1 times y sub 1 plus c sub 2 times y sub 2 plus continue this pattern up to c sub n times y sub n is also a solution to the differential equation. So a linear combination is simply the sum of our n solutions multiplied by a constant. So each specific solution, y sub 1, y sub 2, up to y sub n, is multiplied by a constant, c sub 1, c sub 2, up to c sub n, and then we sum those products together. That's what a linear combination is called. We're going to see that word linear combination quite a bit. So here's the idea. If I have an nth order linear differential equation that happens to be homogeneous, that is the right side function is a zero, then I can anticipate n solutions. We're going to call those specific solutions y sub 1, y sub 2, up to y sub n. In addition, each of those solutions works in the differential equation on their own, but their linear combination also creates a solution to the differential equation. So they work as solutions individually on their own, and if I add them all up, in a linear combination, that also satisfies the differential equation. That's the principle of superposition. Let's explore the principle of superposition on example two. Given solutions, y sub one equals e to the two x, and y sub two equals e to the negative three x, find a particular solution of the form y equals c sub one y sub one plus c sub two y sub two, to the differential equation, y double prime plus y prime minus 6y equals 0, subject to y of 0 equals 7 and y prime of 0 equals negative 1. So that's a lot of information in one problem. Let's make some observations and make sure we know what all of these unique aspects represent. First of all, this is our differential equation. It is a linear differential equation. In particular, it is a second order homogeneous linear differential equation. Second order because the highest derivative is the second derivative, homogeneous because we have a zero left over on the other side. Also observe for this differential equation, the coefficient functions are all constants. The coefficients are one, one, and negative six. So we are dealing with a second order linear homogeneous differential equation with constant coefficients. Now, that is a great description of that differential equation. In fact, let's jot it down. This is a second order linear homogeneous differential equation with constant coefficients. The second observation is that we have been given two solutions. We have solutions y sub 1 equals e to the 2x and y sub 2 equals e to the negative 3x. We did not solve this differential equation. We were provided with these specific solutions. Our job is to find a particular solution of the form y equals c sub 1 y sub 1 plus c sub 2 y sub 2. The way we're going to get from this general solution to particular solution is by applying those two given initial conditions. So let's call this our general solution and let's add in some details. So we're going to write this as c sub 1 times y sub 1, well that's e to the 2x, 
plus c sub 2 y sub 2, that's e to the negative 3x. So here we have a general solution. The general solution is a linear combination of the two unique solutions that were provided. Remember, each of these solutions on their own would satisfy the differential equation. If I found the derivatives and plugged them in, I would get a balanced equation. But now also, by the principle of superposition, we know that this function, if I found appropriate derivatives and plugged it in, would also balance that differential equation. Now, by this time in this class, you have gone from general solution to a particular solution by applying initial conditions many times over. So this is really nothing new. Let's start with our first initial condition. The first initial condition is y of 0 equals 7. So I'm going to plug 7 in for y and 0 in for x. This is going to lead me to the equation 7 equals c sub 1 plus c sub 2. That's an algebraic linear equation in two variables. To get a solution to a linear equation in two variables, I need another function or another equation. We're going to obtain that second equation from our second initial condition. It's given to be y prime of 0 equals negative 1. Now, to plug this one in, we're going to need the first derivative of our solution. So let's come back over here and find y prime. We would end up with 2c sub 1 e to the 2x minus 3c sub 2 e to the negative 3x. So plugging negative 1 in for y prime and 0 in for x, we end up with the equation negative 1 equals 2c sub 1 minus 3c sub 2. Now our problem is no longer a differential equation. Our problem now is an algebraic system of equations. So I need to solve this system for c sub 1 and c sub 2. Now you're free to solve it with any method that you want. You can do substitution, you can do addition, you can also use the matrix function on your calculator if you want to. So in case you haven't done that in a while, let me remind you how to enter this into your calculator. I'm going to go to my matrix menu by typing second matrix and I'm going to edit matrix A. I'm going to press enter next to A, and this is going to be a two by three matrix, two rows and three columns. Now, when I wrote it down in my notes, I had the constants on the left. We need the constants in the rightmost column. So in column one, I'm going to record coefficients of C sub one, and in column two, I'm going to record coefficients of C sub two. So in our first equation, we had c sub 1 plus c sub 2 equals 7. In our second equation, we had 2 times c sub 1 minus 3 times c sub 2 equals negative 1. Okay, so once our matrix is entered, I'm going to type second, quit, and that takes me back to the home screen. Then I'm going to go immediately back to the matrix menu, and this time around, I'm going to choose math. I'm going to arrow down until I find the RREF function. That's double REF, not single REF. This represents reduced row echelon form. I'm going to apply that to matrix A, because I named my matrix matrix A, and press enter. And it reduces the matrix for us. Over there in the rightmost column, that's called the augment, we see the solution to the system. So C sub 1 equals 4 and c sub 2 equals 3. So we can make our conclusion that c sub 1, c sub 2 equals 4, 3. Okay, and that's sufficient work to show, by the way, you can solve that system efficiently with your calculator and record the answer. We can say, therefore, the particular solution is y equals, so I'm looking at my general solution and updating it with my constants, y equals 4e to the 2x plus 3e to the negative 3x. So remember, y sub 1 and y sub 2 on their own individually balance the given differential equation. And you could also take a couple of derivatives and plug in our new particular solution which is the superposition of our two unique solutions, 
um, in a particular form, right? I could plug that into the differential equation and it would also balance the equation. At this point, you may be wondering, well, how do I know if there's any other solutions to this differential equation? And have I covered all the important information in the general solution? Is it possible that the general solution has another term that I could add on that would also balance this differential equation? And we're going to answer that question by first examining the principle of linear independence. Here comes another definition. The n functions, f sub 1, f sub 2, up to f sub n, are linearly independent if, now here's yet another symbol, this time instead of a backwards a or an upside down a, we're looking at a backwards e. This is called the existential quantifier. We're going to read it, there exists. Okay, when you see the backwards e, we read it, there exists. Remember, the upside down a represents the phrase for all. That's the universal quantifier. The backwards e represents the phrase there exists. That's the existential quantifier. So these functions are linearly independent. Oh, wait, back up. I'm sorry. Not independent. I started with dependent. We're going to look at both concepts. Let's start with dependent. If there exists constants, c sub 1, c sub 2, up to c sub n, not all 0, such that the linear combination, c sub 1, f sub 1, plus c sub 2, f sub 2, plus dot, 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 c sub n, f sub n, equals 0. So the idea is, if I can form a linear combination of those n given functions, and I can find constants, that are not all zero such that the linear combination equals zero, that means that there must be cancellation occurring between those terms, right? So it may simply mean that f sub 1 and f sub n are multiples of each other. If they're multiples of each other, I can figure out non-zero constants so that when I add them up, they cancel out. Looking at it from another perspective, we could say thus, the functions are linearly independent if the linear combination c sub 1, f sub 1, plus c sub 2, f sub 2, up to c sub n, f sub n equals 0 implies that all of our constants, c sub 1 equals c sub 2 equals c sub n, they're all 0. That means the only way that I can get that linear combination to equal zero is by using the trivial solution. That is, all of my coefficients are zeros. To begin understanding this concept of linear independence, we're going to examine pairwise independence, and then we're going to examine a whole list of functions. If I have a pair of functions, then really you're going to be able to look at it and use your intuition to determine if they are linearly independent or not. Note, functions are linearly independent if no function is a linear combination or think scalar multiple of the others. Now, many of you have already been through Calculus 3. Some of you are concurrently taking Calculus 3. So relate this to what you know about vectors. How do you tell if two vectors are parallel? Well, they're parallel if one is a scalar multiple of another. For example, the vector 2, negative 1, 3 is parallel to the vector negative 4, 2, and negative 6. How do I know? Because one is a scalar multiple of the other. If I multiply that first vector, component by component, by negative 2, that's going to give me that second vector. Since they are parallel vectors, they are along the same line, right? We could put them all in standard form and see that they're all on the same line. They are dependent on the same line. They are linearly dependent. Now, if you cannot find a scalar multiple to move from one vector to the next, then they are not along the same line. They are linearly independent. So if associating that with vectors helps you to understand this concept, then sometimes that's how our brain remembers. So let's apply this in example three. Determine if the pairs of functions are linearly dependent or independent. 
So on example A, we've got the functions sine of x, cosine of x, correct my typo. I've got a couple of typos here. Those two are not scalar multiples of each other. That means I cannot multiply sine of x by a constant to get cosine of x. So these are linearly independent. Now I'm just using intuition as our guide here. I'm gonna show you a more concrete proof of this coming up pretty soon. Let's look at example B, x and the absolute value of x. There is no single constant that I can multiply x by to get the absolute value of x, so these are also linearly independent. Looking at e to the x and e to the negative 2x, I notice that the exponents are scalar multiples, but I cannot multiply e to the x by a constant to produce the other function e to the negative 2x. So these are linearly independent functions. Let's look at e to the x and x e to the x. Well, I can multiply the first function e to the x by x to get the second function x e to the x, but it is definitely not a scalar. So these are linearly independent. Next, we have x plus 1 and x squared. Well, there's not a constant that I can multiply the first function by to get the second function, so these are also linearly independent. Okay, now change the next example. I don't want it to be sine of x. I want it to be sine of 2x, okay? Let's compare sine of 2x and sine of x cosine of x. Are they linearly independent or dependent? Is there a scalar multiple that I could multiply one or the other function by to generate the other function? And the answer on this one is yes. If you think about your double angle identity for uh, sine of 2x, sine of 2x is 2 sine of x times cosine of x, right? Which is a scalar multiple of that second function. So these would be examples of linearly dependent functions, okay? So if I form a linear combination of sine of 2x and sine of x cosine of x, I can get it to equal zero without using all zero constants. For example, the linear combination sine of 2x minus 2 times sine of x cosine of x equals 0. So I was able to use non-zero constants, let's assume we have a 1 over here, to form a linear combination to get that to equal 0. So those are examples of linearly dependent functions. If we looked at the original example, sine of x and sine of x cosine of x, those would be linearly independent. Let's look at example four. Now, I really want you to pay attention to example four because the homework in your textbook will have these exact instructions, <laughs> and it really cracks me up. It will say, find a non-trivial linear combination. Non-trivial means all of my constants can't be simultaneously zero. Okay, that's too easy, making them all zero. We're looking for something other than the trivial combination. Find a non-trivial linear combination of the given functions that vanishes identically. Have you ever seen so much vocabulary in one statement? Okay, what does that mean? That means I want to figure out a linear combination. So c sub 1 times f of x plus c sub 2 times g of x. What in the world does vanish identically mean? That means equals zero. <laughs> Vanishes identically means equals zero. Okay, so we need to find a linear combination of the given functions that equals zero where I have non-zero values for C1 and C2. Okay, once we decipher what the instructions mean, then we can actually carry out the problem. So my first function here is f of x equals zero. The second one is g of x equals sine of x, and the third one is h of x equals e to the x. Considering those three functions, comparing them in a pairwise fashion, are they linearly dependent or independent? Well, specifically, g and h are linearly independent, right? There is no constant that I can multiply one by to produce the other function. Since these are linearly independent, then the only way that I can form a linear combination, let's go ahead and write it down,
the only way I can form a linear combination and have it vanish identically, remember that means equals zero, is by using the trivial combination or the trivial solution. So C sub one, C sub two, C sub three must all equal zero. This is the trivial solution. The trivial solution is the only one that works for linearly independent functions. Okay, let's look at example B. F of x equals 17, g of x equals 2 sine squared of x, and h of x equals 3 cosine squared of x. Let's build our linear combination. So we have c sub 1 times 17 plus c sub 2 times 2 sine squared of x plus c sub 3 times 3 cosine squared of x. And we want this to be equal to 0. So our goal is to figure out a set of constants, there's going to be multiple answers on these problems, any set of constants where this is true, where our constants are non-zero. Now one thing that will be helpful on this problem is to rewrite those trig functions in terms of a single trig function. So I'm going to rewrite this as 17 c sub 1 plus 2 c sub 2. I'll keep the sine squared of x and I'm going to rewrite this 3 c sub 3 times, let's convert cosine squared into sine squared. We can write that as 1 minus sine squared of x equals 0. Now, let's combine like terms. We have constant 17c sub 1, and then notice down here when I distribute this, I'm going to have another constant 3c sub 3. I'm going to group my constants together, okay? Then, notice we're going to have a couple of sine squared terms. 1 has a coefficient of 2c sub 2, and the other one has a coefficient of minus 3c sub 3. So I'm factoring out those coefficients in order to combine like terms for uh, sine squared of x. So we're just working a little bit of algebra over there. Now we're going to do something called um, equating corresponding coefficients. This might remind you of determining the coefficients when you work partial fractions. If this is a true equation, then what we have on the left should be identical to what we have on the right. So notice here we have a constant term plus some multiple of sine squared of x. For this to be equal to zero, we would have to assume that that constant is zero and the coefficient of sine squared is also zero. So I'm going to set the first constant, 17c sub 1 plus c 3 sub 3. That must be equal to zero. And we can also observe that 2c sub 2 minus 3c sub 3, where did I get it? Yeah, equal to 0. Here we have two equations, three variables. Notice this is a linear system. So I'm going to write it in matrix form. In column 1, I'm going to record the coefficients of c sub 1. Notice in equation 2, there is no c sub 1. In column 2, we'll have coefficients of c sub 2. There's 0 c sub 2 in equation 1, 2 in equation 2. And then in column 3, we'll have coefficients of c sub 3. We have 3 and negative 3. Then over here in the augment, we're going to record our constants, which are both zeros. So in algebra, we know that if we have fewer equations than variables, we have a dependent system. What does that mean? That means we have an infinite number of solutions to this system. We just need to find one solution. So again, I'm going to use my calculator to reduce this matrix. So I'm going to go back to my matrix function, second matrix, and you can choose to just type right over the matrix that you had there if you wish, or you can arrow down, I'm going to call this one B, matrix B. This has two rows and four columns this time. So our entries are 17, 0, 3, 0, and for equation 2, 0, 2, negative 3, 0. Okay, now remember I called mine matrix B, so I'm going to second quit back to the home screen. I'm going to go back to the matrix menu and choose math, and by the way, it's a little bit of a shortcut to get to RREF, if you use your up arrow key, okay, so I'm going to choose RREF. I'm going to go back to the matrix menu, and remember I called mine matrix B, so make sure we apply that to matrix B, and evaluate. 
So it might be helpful too if we convert this into fraction form. So this is the reduced form of our matrix. I want to go ahead and record that on my notes. So when we reduce this, we end up with columns 1, 0, 0, 1, 3 seventeenths, negative 3 halves, and in the augment we had a couple of zeros. So let's go ahead and translate this back into equation form. Equation number one, remember column one was C sub one, column two is C sub two, and column three is C sub three. So row one translates into the equation C sub one minus three seventeenths C sub three equals zero. Notice from this equation that we could get C sub one in terms of C sub three. So I'm just gonna add that to both sides. Translating equation two, we would obtain C sub two minus 3 halves c sub 3 equals 0. And again, we can get the second coefficient, c sub 2, in terms of c sub 3. We will have a solution as long as our three coefficients, c sub 1, c sub 2, and c sub 3, all have this relationship. I just, remember, need to find one non-trivial linear combination. So I'm going to choose a convenient value for c sub 3. Because we have denominators of 17 and 2 here, I'm going to let c sub 3 be the uh, lowest common denominator between 17 and 2. So 2 times 17 is 34, okay? If c sub 3 is 34, then c sub 1 will be 3 seventeenths times 34. Or when we reduce, we would end up with 6. And c sub 2 would be 3 halves times c sub 3, 3 halves times 34, or 51, okay? Therefore, our non-trivial set of coefficients, c sub 1, c sub 2, and c sub 3, would be 6, 51, and 34. So if I use those values for my coefficients, then this equation would vanish identically. Now remember, let's say you look your answer up in the back of the book and your numbers aren't the same. Well, if I had chosen C sub 3 equal to 1, my numbers would be different. So as long as your solution is a scalar multiple, term by term, for the answers given in the back of the book, that means your constants have the same relationship as those that are provided. Now remember, there's an infinite number of possibilities here. We just had to find one. At this point, we've been using our intuition to examine linear independence, but now I want to give you a more concrete proof for determining linear independence. We're going to use something called the Ron scan. Now, for those of you that have finished Calculus 3, this is probably going to remind you of the Jacobian. Or if you're concurrently in Calculus 3, put the Jacobian on your radar. When you get there, it will remind you of the Ron scan. Definition, the Ronskian of functions f sub 1, f sub 2, up to f sub n, denoted big W of f sub 1, f sub 2, up to f sub n, is given by the determinant. Okay, so we're going to form a determinant. This determinant is called the Ronskian. Remember when you see the vertical bars, not the brackets, the vertical bars indicate a pending operation called determinant. So on row one, we're going to have all of our functions, f sub one up to f sub n. On row two, we're going to find the first derivative of each of those functions. On row three, we'll find the second derivative of each of those functions. And then on the last row, the nth row, we're going to find the n minus first derivative of all of those functions. Remember, a determinant is only defined for a square matrix. So if you're not sure where to stop, stop when your rows and columns are equal we should end up with an n by n matrix. The Ron scan is useful in determining if many functions are pairwise linearly dependent or independent. So once we calculate this Ron scan, we're gonna run it through a test. Suppose that y sub one, y sub two, up to y sub n are n solutions to the nth order linear homogeneous differential equation. Remember, we defined this earlier. In particular, we're looking at a homogeneous differential equation because it's equal to zero. Then, if y sub 1, y sub 2, up to y sub n are linearly dependent, then the Ronskian is equal to zero, okay? 
So the way to remember that, if your Ron scan is dependent on zero, then your functions are linearly independent. Part B, if y sub 1, y sub 2 up to y sub 1 are linearly independent, then the Ron scan will be independent from 0 or not equal to 0, okay? Let's go ahead and apply this on example 5. The functions y sub 1 equal to e to the x, y sub 2 equals e to the 2x, and y sub 3 equals e to the 3x are particular solutions of the third order differential equation, third derivative of y minus 6y double prime plus 11y prime minus 6y equals 0. Show that they are linearly independent and find a general solution. So we have a third order linear homogeneous differential equation with constant coefficients. And we are provided three particular solutions. Our job is to demonstrate that they are linearly independent. Now, by your intuition, you can probably suspect that they are linearly independent, but let's go ahead and use our Ron scan to prove it. So the Ron scan of e to the x, e to the 2x, and e to the 3x is going to be a 3 by 3 determinant where row 1 contains the functions as they are, e to the x, e to the 2x, and e to the 3x. Row 2 is the derivative of each of those functions. So we have e to the x, 2e to the 2x, and 3e to the 3x. And row 3 is the second derivative of those functions, or the first derivative of row 2. So we get e to the x, 4e to the 2x, and 9e to the 3x. Now, if you're in Calculus 3, calculating cross products right now, you are used to calculating 3 by 3 determinants. You can expand about any row or column. I'm actually going to expand across row one. So I'm gonna take the first entry in row one, and I'm going to multiply by the little two by two minor determinant right here, okay? So if you cover up row one and column one, and then you calculate the two by two determinant of what's left, that's the minor of our first component. So we're gonna have 2e to the 2x times 9e to the 3x. That gives me 18e to the 5x. And remember, you subtract the reverse diagonal product. That's going to give me minus 12e to the 5x. Then I'm going to move on to the second element in row 1. And remember, I need to alternate the sign. So the second element in row 1 has coefficient e to the 2x. I'm going to cover up its row and column. And I've got a little minor 2 by 2 left behind. So we're going to calculate that little 2 by 2. That's going to be e to the x times 9e to the 3x minus this reverse diagonal product. So it's going to give us 9e to the 4x minus 3e to the 4x. We have one more element in row 1. We're going to go back to a positive coefficient here. And we're going to cover up its row and column and calculate the minor 2 by 2 here. Forward diagonal product minus reverse diagonal product. That's going to give me forward diagonal product, 4e to the 3x minus reverse diagonal product, 2e to the 3x. So calculating a Ron scan is very similar to calculating a cross product or simply a 3 by 3 determinant. So simplifying, we have e to the x times 6e to the 5x minus e to the 2x times 6e to the 4x plus e to the 3x times 2e to the 3x. Multiplying, we have 6e to the 6x minus 6e to the 6x, those terms will cancel, plus 2e to the 6x. So our Ron scan ends up being 2e to the 6x. Now we're interested in, does the Ron scan equal zero or not? Well, we can say since the Ron scan 2e to the 6x is not equal to zero, for all x, that is all x in the domain of that exponential function from negative infinity to infinity, we have here our Ronskian is independent of zero, right? Since the Ronskian is 
independent from zero for all x, then the functions are linearly, what's the answer? Independent or dependent? Independent. Now here's why that's important. Why have we spent so much time on linear independence? Well, first of all, we know the principle of superposition. That is, when you form a linear combination of given solutions, that linear combination is itself a solution. And now we also know that we can use a Ron scan to establish linear independence. We're going to put those two concepts together and establish the general solution to a linear differential equation. Building upon all of those concepts, we'll examine solutions also of non-homogeneous equations. Theorem 5. Let y sub p be a particular solution of the non-homogeneous equation given by, notice here we have an nth order linear non-homogeneous differential equation with non-constant coefficients on i, where f of x and p sub i of x are continuous for all i. Now, here's where linear independence and superposition comes into play, okay? So I've got a particular solution. He's kind of a maverick. He's off by itself. And now I have y sub 1, y sub 2, up to y sub n. These are going to be n linearly independent solutions of the associated homogeneous equation, okay? This one is non-homogeneous. This one is homogeneous. So here's what I know. For this nth order homogeneous equation, I have n solutions. I also know by the principle of superposition that their linear combination itself will be a solution. Now if I also know that they are linearly independent solutions, then the linear combination is the general solution. There is no other term that I could add to that general solution that would also balance that equation, okay? So if I have an nth order homogeneous differential equation and I have n solutions that are linearly independent, then by the principle of superposition, their linear combination is a solution and that is the general solution, okay? So I have the general solution of the homogeneous differential equation, and I have a particular solution to the non-homogeneous differential equation. So we're going to put it all together. If big Y is any solution whatsoever of the non-homogeneous equation, then there exists, remember the backwards Z is there exists, constants, C sub 1, C sub 2, up to C sub n, n are, that is elements of the real number system, Okay, look at the difference between there exists and the element symbol from set theory. So it's just saying those constants are real numbers. Such that, okay, big finish. The general solution to our nth order linear non-homogeneous equation with non-constant coefficients is big Y equals C sub 1 times Y sub 1 plus C sub 2 times Y sub 2 plus dot 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 plus c sub n times y sub n. Pause right there for just a minute. You should recognize that as a linear combination of n linearly independent solutions. That itself is the solution to the homogeneous version of the equation. We call this y sub c. That is the complementary function. So we're going to find that by solving the corresponding homogeneous equation. And then this particular solution, y sub p, okay, y sub p, that is the particular term. Your book calls it the particular solution. It's a little different than <laughs> the particular solution associated with refining the general solution with initial conditions to get the particular solution. That y sub p term, I like to call it the particular term, it's the term that we're going to add to take care of this non-homogeneous function over here. Now, at this point, we haven't learned how to solve any of this. We're just looking at how the general solution is assimilated, understanding superposition, linear independence,
homogeneous, non-homogeneous, and how to express the sum of the complementary function plus the particular solution. We'll actually learn how to find that in later sections, okay? So the general solution to our non-homogeneous equation, very simply, is y sub c plus y sub p, where y sub c, the complementary function, satisfies the homogeneous equation, and y sub p satisfies the non-homogeneous equation. Then this function big Y is the solution to our non-homogeneous equation. I know it's a lot of vocabulary, but I think you'll find in the big picture that chapter two is actually easier than chapter one. <laughs> so I hope that encourages you. Let's do two more examples and we'll call it a day. Example six, for the given differential equation, find a particular solution satisfying the given initial conditions. So in example A, we have a second order, whoops, second order linear non-homogeneous differential equation with constant coefficients, okay? Second order because the highest derivative we can find is the second derivative, non-homogeneous because this side is non-zero, and we're just observing we have non-constant coefficients for the dependent variable y and its derivatives. Now look what we have. We have the complementary function this is a linear combination of two linearly independent solutions. e to the 2x and e to the negative 2x are linearly independent. Okay, remember second order, we get two solutions. So their linear combination is also a solution. Now we're also provided with this particular term, y sub p equals negative 3. And what we want to do is form the general solution, apply the initial conditions, and make it a particular solution. So our general solution, which is of the form y equals c sub one, let, let me do it more generally, y equals y sub c plus y sub p, okay? The complementary function plus the particular term. With a little more detail, this looks like c sub one e to the two x, plus c sub 2 e to the negative 2x. Now I'm going to add my particular term, and don't be tempted to give it a c sub 3. You just tack your particular term right on to the end, okay? That is our general solution. We want to convert it into a particular solution. I know you know how to do that, right? We're going to apply our initial conditions. Notice our first con initial condition is for y. The second one is for y prime. So while we're here, let's go ahead and find y prime y prime is 2c sub 1 e to the 2x minus 2c sub 2 e to the negative 2x, and the derivative of negative 3 is 0. The first initial condition we have is y of 0 equals 0. So when we plug this in to this equation, and I'm going to put um, the bulk of that equation on the left, okay, so the c1 e to the 2x, we're plugging 0 in for x, we'd have c1 times e to the 0 that's just c1, plus c2 times e to the 0 also just c2, minus 3, equals 0, okay? Our second initial condition is y prime of 0 equals 10. So plugging it into this side, we have 2c sub 1 times e to the 0 which is 1, minus 2c sub 2 times e to the 0, which is 1, equals y prime, or 10. Let's rewrite that in matrix form. Remember that in matrix form, the equations have to be in standard form. So for equation 1, I have 1c1 plus 1c2 equals 3. We need to move that 3 to the constant side in order for our REF to work. Row 2 looks like 2 negative 2, and 10. Again, feel free to solve that any way you want. You don't necessarily have to use matrices. You can use substitution, you can use addition, or you can use matrices. So in row 1, we had coefficients 1, 1, and 3. And in row 2, we had coefficients 2, negative 2, and 10. So it uh, looks like I named that matrix B, so I'm going to be careful. <laughs> Second matrix math, 
I'm going to pick up RREF and apply that to the appropriate matrix B. And our solution is 4, negative 1. So this reduces to reduced row echelon form with augment 4, negative 1. So I'm going to go back to my general solution and refine it and make it a particular solution. So looking at this, our particular solution would be y equals, we found 4 for c1, so we have 4e to the 2x, negative 1 for c2, so minus e to the negative 2x, and our particular term minus 3. So this is the particular solution to the non-homogeneous linear differential equation with those specific initial conditions. Okay, let's look at one last problem. We have the third derivative of y minus 6y double prime plus 11y prime minus 6y equals 0. So we have a third order, notice, linear homogeneous differential equation. Since it's homogeneous, we will not need the particular term. But because we have a third order differential equation, we need three solutions. We have y1, y2, and y3. So the general solution to this differential equation is y equals c sub 1, y sub 1, plus c sub 2, y sub 2, plus c sub 3, y sub 3. Again, no particular term is needed, no y sub p because we're dealing with a homogeneous differential equation. Filling in the details, we have c sub 1 e to the x, plus c sub 2 e to the 2x, plus c sub 3 e to the 3x. Okay, so we want to go from general solution to particular solution. Notice we have three initial conditions. To apply those initial conditions, we also need our first two derivatives. So I'm going to go ahead and do that here. Y prime is c sub 1 e to the x plus 2 c sub 2 e to the 2x plus 3 c sub 3 e to the 3x. And y double prime is c sub 1 e to the x plus 4 c sub 2 e to the 2x plus 9 c sub 3 e to the 3x. Now, in each case, we're going to be plugging 0 in for x and setting it equal to the given condition. So I feel pretty confident that you can follow if we go ahead and start our matrix form now. In column 1, we'll have coefficients of c sub 1, column 2 for c sub 2, column 3 for c sub 3, and in the augment, we'll put our constants or the values of our initial condition. So plugging 0 in for x, right in those spots we would have 1c1 1c2 1c3 equals 2 okay plugging 0 in for x in our derivative the coefficients of c sub 1 the coefficient would be 1 2 3 and this will be equal to 0 and then finally plugging 0 in for x and y double prime picking up coefficients of the c's we would have 1 4 9 and this will be equal to 3. Solve it any way you want. I'm going to opt for matrix form. So I'm going to begin by entering the matrix. I'm going to call this one matrix A. This is a 3 by 4 matrix. So our first row contains entries 1, 2, 3, and 0. Oops, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong line here. How about 1, 1, 1 and 0. Row 2 then is 1, 2, 3, and 0. Oops. Whew, I'm getting tired, y'all. Are you paying attention? That last entry in row 1 should be 2. Okay? So we have 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 0. And then working on our last row, 1, 4, 9, and 3. Okay, hopefully we got that plugged in correctly. I'm going to go back to the home screen, return to the matrix menu to choose math. I want my RREF function, and I'll apply that to matrix A. And we end up with 
decimals, I'm going to go ahead and convert that to a fraction. So math number one, fraction. 15 over 2, negative 9, and 7 over 2 in the augment. So back to our notes. This becomes, on the left side, we have reduced row echelon form. And in the augment, we had 15 over 2, negative 9, and 7 over 2. So we can make the observation C sub 1, C sub 2, C sub 3 has the values as displayed in the augment, or the rightmost column of our matrix. And we can go back and refine our general solution and make it a particular solution by plugging in the values for C. So I'm going back to my general solution, and we can say Y equals C sub 1, that's 15 over 2 e to the x, plus C sub 2, that's going to be negative 9 e to the 2x, plus C sub 3, that's 7 over 2 e to the 3x. We know that there is no other term that we should seek after in order to get a more general solution or more information for this solution because we started with a third order differential equation. We had three linearly independent solutions. By the principle of superposition, we know that this is also a solution and in fact it is the general solution. There was no particular term to deal with on this one. So we could apply our initial conditions directly and get our particular solution. So make sure that you can tell the difference between a linear and a nonlinear differential equation. Make sure you know the difference between a homogeneous and a non-homogeneous differential equation. That you understand the principles of superposition and linear independence. And you know how to express the general solution of a non-homogeneous differential equation. That is y equals the complementary function y sub c plus the particular term. All right, good job.